Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Pasord and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in London. And I'm in conversation today with Lars Ayer. Uh, Lars is a lecturer in philosophy at Newcastle University. He's the author of several novels. Uh, the first three are Spurious, Dogma and Exodus, all of which have been critically acclaimed. And I'm delighted to be talking to Lars today about his latest novel, which is entitled Wittgenstein Jr. I want to start by asking you, Lars, you're, you've become famous um, for these novels that you're, you're writing and um, which are being nominated for prizes and are, and are critically acclaimed. Um, you, you're clearly interested in the idea of telling a story because you're writing novels, but it's a slightly unusual thing to do for an academic philosopher. And many academics look down on the notion of storytelling, fiction, novels, films, as a way of communicating an academic discipline. So so why are you doing this? Why are you telling stories or writing novels? And, and is it a way uh, of communicating something about your academic discipline that you think couldn't be communicated in any other way? I think uh, the, the, the topic of my, of my fiction is the, of the way in which order breaks down into chaos and the attempt to be rigorous and clear can fall apart into a, into a kind of madness. Now this is not something which I necessarily want to write a sober and detached uh, a work of philosophy about. This is something I think uh, best staged in the novel. And are you interested in storytelling? Do you consume stories yourself? I suppose um, I'm interested in storytelling. I'm interested in stories which run up against something which cannot be easily narrated. And is there a tradition in philosophy of this? Again, I, I'm, I'm woefully lacking in my knowledge of philosophy, but I seem to remember Jean-Paul Sartre writing a novel called Nausea. I can't remember many other examples of, of, of established philosophers using story as a form of communicating something to do with philosophy. Well, going right back to uh, Plato, you know, uh, Socrates, the Socrates we meet in Plato's dialogues, is very much a fictional character. And um, Plato's dialogues, in which, he, in which Socrates plays a role as a character, those dialogues are very much um, fiction, stories. And do you think it's a neglected form amongst academic philosoph philosophers that they should be embracing the story form a bit more than they do? It's something which can certainly communicate to a larger audience. And philosophers over the, over the centuries have returned to story forms. And many philosophers have tried to write uh, dialogues in which you have a fictional persona. Now, one of the central characters in this book, Wittgenstein Jr., is a is a, a Cambridge Don, who I have to say, reading the novel as a psychiatrist, wearing my psychiatrist hat, seems at various levels to be insane, um, or is going insane, um, and I think he himself worries about his mental health, and certainly his students are, are worrying about his mental health, it seems, from the novel. Is there a link between insanity and, and, and philosophy? Are, are many philosophers thought to have been driven insane by very deep thinking or were they a bit insane in the first place to take up philosophy? I think the kinds of questions that philosophers oppose themselves um, are the kinds of questions which can, if you obsess over them, um, tip you over the edge. But it's likely that those philosophers who ask those questions were already um, mentally disturbed to some degree in the first place. In the real Wittgenstein, the, 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 the philosopher born in 1889, died, died in 1952, uh, the real, uh, the real Wittgenstein feared madness um, tremendously. He said, um, "If in life we are surrounded by death, so too in the health of our intellect we are surrounded by madness." So the real Wittgenstein was terribly afraid of madness, and so too is uh, is, is the Wittgenstein of my novel, um, Wittgenstein Junior, who is a philosopher working in the Cambridge of the present. Is there any other link between the real Wittgenstein and your novel? Are you trying to say something about the real Wittgenstein's philosophy in this novel? Well, I think there's, there's an overlap between the, uh, the real Wittgenstein and my character, Wittgenstein Jr. Uh, both are from a, um, a German-speaking country. Uh, both are from families who converted to Judaism. Uh, sorry, converted from Judaism to Catholicism. Uh, both are, are, are philosophers with a strong interest in logic. Uh, both worked at Cambridge University, both very, very suspicious of, of academics and of the university um, scene. And like the real Wittgenstein, my character is homosexual, but he's ambivalent about romantic relationships. Um, so there's a real overlap in terms of character and in terms of the intensity and focus which they brought to philosophy. I mean, both of them are possessed of this tremendous sense of, um, of vocation 
and both of them measure themselves very severely by what they perceive to be their failure um, in, in the field of philosophy. The other sense I get is that this character and many of the characters in your in your novel seem somewhat isolated. There seems a link between being a philosopher and being isolated, either isolated from your colleagues or isolated from the world in general, or a sense of alienation from the world. And there is a very strong overlap there with mental illness or insanity, um, in that people with severe mental illnesses also develop a sense of isolation. Um, do you want to? Is there anything you can say about that? That that tendency, it seems, that philosophers seem to become isolated from the world? The kind of work that philosophers are doing often separates them from other people. The kinds of concerns they have are very different, um, by and large, the concerns of, 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 of people in the world, you know, in many ways, not, not in every way, but in many ways. The intensity they bring to their studies can also be isolating. On the other hand, even though that they are um, alienated, as you say, and, and often... Um, very lonely individuals, they have a kind of charisma as well. They can attract acolytes, um, who can sometimes be mere imitators, but who sometimes can be more than imitators. This idea of, of, of a charismatic, solitary figure and that rises again and again in the history of philosophy. And your central character seems certainly to attract acolytes, and there's something quite interesting about that, which is that they, a lot of the time, don't really know what he's talking about. They don't really think they understand him, but somehow they hang in there, lecture after lecture, because they believe that they're, they're almost touching greatness. Um, and it's that kind of faith that he's got something profound to say, though they're not quite sure what it is, I think, is also very interesting. Um, there's a sense in which you're, you're trying to say something about the academic life there, I think, in general. Well. Wittgenstein Jr., like the real Wittgenstein, was very suspicious of academics and very suspicious of Cambridge University in particular. And my character, Wittgenstein, feels very, very alienated by contemporary academic um, culture, which even in philosophy is ruled by the necessity to obtain grants and to network and uh, make friends and allies and to generally promote your work. This is something which is an unfortunate necessity that anyone uh, working in philosophy um, now faces. So my character, Wittgenstein Jr., feels very alienated by that, that necessity that he promote himself, that he network, that he uh, present himself um, for, uh, as, as a grant chaser, as, as someone who's looking for, for money from various bodies to continue his research. So that's something which he struggles with, and that struggle is something his students see. Um, his students see in Wittgenstein someone who has a sense of vocation, a sense in which ordinary life is um, not sufficient. One has to push oneself beyond it. So his students respond to this, 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 um, this awareness that they have that there could be more to life. And Wittgenstein seems to, seems to be a seeker after wisdom, someone who's looking for this more than life. And that's why they want to follow him. He seems alienated from the, the modern academic life. He looks down his nose at his colleagues who are doing all this stuff that you mentioned that, that you have to do in the modern academic world, chase grants, network, promote your work. Um, there is a sense I get from the novel of, of what, what permeates academic institutions now is a sense of disappointment. The students turn up and they're disappointed by what they meet and the academics are disappointed by the career that they've chosen and disappointed by the students. Um, again, is, is that a fair appraisal of, of what you're trying to communicate? I wonder, yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting question, it's an interesting way of putting things, disappointment, and what is it the students are looking for? Certainly when I studied philosophy, I knew very little about it when I first came to university. I had the sense that it was somehow about um, broad questions of life, broad questions that couldn't be answered easily in any other disciplines. So I felt there would be a kind of existential charge to studying philosophy. That it would be about um, thinking about questions of meaning and, and purpose. When I study philosophy, I, I, I study many fascinating things. You know, it's, it's a wonderful subject to study. But I, I didn't really feel that existential charge, that sense of um, involvement in, in these larger questions. Um, I wonder whether uh, older Greek models of philosophy, where you might apprentice, apprentice yourself to a particular thinker for, for a long period, but those models of, of teaching and learning uh, might promote um, 
um, more of this sense of philosophies about wisdom, about lived wisdom, about uh, a general sense of, um, of, of, of seeking, of looking for something. And that's, that's what I, I may well be lacking um, in, in contemporary academia. I thought, and again, I, I'm a bit worried that I'm really going to put my foot in it here. I thought there were two distinct traditions in philosophy. There was a tradition of, of what is truth, what is real, what exists, which is kind of slightly dry and analytic. But there's another tradition, which is what is the virtuous life? How, how should we lead our lives? Which seems much more personally relevant. How, how do we decide what's right and what's wrong? How, what ought we to do with our lives? Um, which seems terrifically person, uh, personally relevant, but, but maybe I think, again, I, I'm, I'm really worried I'm putting my foot in it here, it seems more representative of, of, of not the sort of English, American, analytic schools of philosophy, but more continental philosophy. But I, I wonder if you could say something about that. Well, Wittgenstein, the real Wittgenstein, is a curious figure because he has many of the traits you might associate with philosophers who... Uh, who lived on the continent and who are famous now as part of the canon of continental philosophy. The real Wittgenstein has many of those traits, but on the other hand, he belongs quite firmly in the tradition of, of Anglo-American um, philosophy. Um, I, I was telling you a little bit about my own background um, as, a, as an undergraduate student, and I, I was schooled in analytic philosophy, um, American Anglo-American philosophy, and my frustration was that we didn't really seem to uh, focus on Philosophy as a way of living, as a way of um, of being, um, as philosophy as a kind of um, incarnate lived wisdom, and that's something which sent me actually to the to the European thinkers, to the continental thinkers. Um, that's why um, I um, eventually ended up writing about these figures um, as an academic. So that was certainly the movement which which I followed. On the other hand, no matter where you turn, um, the university, the structure of the university is always a challenge to learning philosophy, to practicing philosophy. It's always, I think, too institutional. And it's also interesting to me as a psychiatrist, although the book in a way is about a central question of whether the, the Don is mad or not, and the students aren't puzzling this over, that no one attempts a psychiatric analysis. No, one's, no one tries to work out what the diagnosis is for the Don, or even dares to suggest he should see a psychiatrist, or Bring, bring a psychiatrist in, and, and there is a sense in which of there's a family history of mental illness. You, you hint at that, I think, quite heavily uh, in the book. So, um, is, there a, is there a suspicion, do you think, between uh, philosophy and psychiatry? Um, I mean, there, there would be naturally one, because psychiatrists have been seen by, by those on the liberal left as kind of thought police, as, as agents of the state. But I thought it was interesting that although there is a central question of, of is this man a deep thinker or is he just insane, no one seems to think about bringing a psychiatrist in. That's right. Um, it's interesting that, isn't it? So the students who admire um, Wittgenstein Jr., these students um, regard him very highly. They, 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 they come to venerate him. They're, they're, they're initially, but they come to venerate him. And in some sense, that they, they would be disturbed by any attempt to contextualize his mental abilities, his mental faculties, by any attempt to explain um, where it is he got his sense of vocation from. They value him, value him as a philosopher, and the value they place on him, I think, is something they would feel is demystified by uh, trying to understand his life um, from a psychiatric perspective. And you see, the, the psychiatric analysis would be that this guy suffers from, amongst other things, possibly a form of obsessive compulsive disorder, more, more the kind of thought end of that spectrum, not the kind of checking and washing of hands spectrum, in the sense that he thinks very, very hard about stuff, but it just ends up making him miserable, and he doesn't seem to go anywhere with it, which actually would fit in a little bit with that spectrum. But I wondered what your thoughts are about that. Well, in the novel, and this is similar to the real Wittgenstein, in the novel, Wittgenstein Jr. says that he's felt enormous joy. You know, on his deathbed, the real Wittgenstein um, um, also said he'd, he'd spent his life in joy. He spent his life wonderfully. Um, he, he said he'd led a wonderful life, which seems to be at odds with what his colleagues and students recollect about him. So the real Wittgenstein felt he led a life, a life of wonder and splendor. And my character, Wittgenstein Jr., says something similar that he experiences enormous joy in following his vocation, even though um, that vocation is something which makes him miserable from time to time, if not um, quite often. The other tension, I think, between psychiatry and philosophy is psychiatrists are concerned if people are embarking down a route, let's say thinking really heavily about stuff, 
but it, it doesn't make them effective in the world. And by effective, we mean being able to conduct relationships, being able to hold down a job, etc., etc. Now, what's really interesting to me about real philosophers in the real world, famous philosophers, is that they often didn't seem to be able to hold down a job. Um, you know, often their friends would have to club together to find them a job to keep them uh, financially solvent. They, they were often profoundly ineffective in relationships and the practical realities of everyday life. Yet, in a sense, because their, their work has lasted over centuries, you know, and, and, and the names of, of, of people who are much more successful in everyday effective life, their contemporaries, we've forgotten all of those people, but we remember the names of these great philosophers. You could say that in a larger sense, they were effective people. But what about this this idea that th these people can be quite profound thinkers, but spectacularly ineffective in everyday life, it seems? This is, I suppose, something which has been there since the very beginning of philosophy in the West. You know, the great philosopher Thales, the first philosopher, um, the Greeks, uh, remember, uh, he was looking up at the stars, very famously looking up at the stars, walking along one night. And he fell down a pit, and, and the women around him laughed. They laughed at him for falling down the pit. He was looking up at the stars. He was speculating. He was thinking. He was dreaming. Philosophy questions are the kind you can only ask, I think, if you're detached in some way from ordinary concerns. If you're detached from ordinary concerns by, by dint of being, I don't know, having a bit of money, having a bit of income, having a, a particular kind of academic post, certainly. But if you're detached from ordinary concerns by being a little odd, by being a rather peculiar person, by feeling a thirst for meaning, by wanting um, to understand the world such that your own um, sense of order, uh, your own sense of, um, of purpose and meaning and goodness uh, is something which you can um, recover and hold on to and, and, uh, and, and, and remain with. So, um, to conclude, you're, you're, you, you enjoy writing stories and, and have found a way of using stories to communicate philosophy and of course at the heart of the dilemma over a story is the ending and the notion of a happy ending and I, I suspect that philosophers would look down in disdain uh, at the notion that a story has to have a happy ending. Uh, in your novel they go to watch the film Pretty Woman which of course has a happy ending and they discuss at some level, I don't, I don't want to spoil the story for, for, for any, any potential reader because it's a wonderful novel um, um, what are your thoughts about the notion of a happy ending? Because, again, I'm nervous about, about entering into territory where, where, where I don't know enough. But Aristotle, I thought, fa had a famous argument about happiness, which says the whole purpose of life is indeed happiness. Because ultimately, whenever you ask people, why do you do what you do? Why does the politician pursue power? Why does the rich man pursue money? Why does the player pursue sex, whatever question they give you an answer to, you say, yes, why, but why do you pursue that, why do you want that, you get into an infinite regress which ends up with happiness, because it will make me happy. So happiness becomes the ultimate end all the time of anything we ever try to do, so happiness actually is quite a profound pursuit. Um, so w what about this idea that the story um, for, for, most, for most people needs to have a happy ending, would, would philosophers be antagonistic to that? Well, I guess it comes back to the, uh, the, the point about um, Wittgenstein, the real Wittgenstein, on his deathbed saying that he'd had a wonderful life. Um, what a philosopher regards as, as, as wonderful or, or, or what would make him or her happy might not be uh, what, we'd, what we'd ordinarily associate with happiness or, 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 with, or something being wonderful. My character, Wittgenstein Jr., insists on his joy, and even though his joy might take him to the verge of of chaos, of insanity, of these terrible emotional states, I think he'd feel that joy was something worthwhile, something worth pursuing. So philosophy accommodates the notion of, of thinking very hard about stuff, even if it leads to ineffectiveness in the world. Is there something useful about philosophy in tolerating the more eccentric amongst us, in tolerating people who aren't necessarily particularly effective, but just have got really wrapped up in a life of the mind? It depends what we mean by effective. I think something you brought up earlier was that we remember these uh, great philosophers from early from earlier eras, and these people often in their lives were not particularly efficacious. They they couldn't get much done. They found it very difficult to hold down a job. Often they were very unwell mentally or, or physically. But even individuals, nevertheless, continue to inform our sense of who it is as human beings um, today. So that, and this is something which we don't only find in in academic circles. Um, philosophical ideas permeate culture at large, they spread out, they become popular and influential. 
Thank you very much indeed, Lars. And just to remind listeners that Lars Ayer uh, is the author of this wonderful new, newly published novel called Wittgenstein Jr., a novel, and it's published by Melville House at UK. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raj.